This is an oral interview for the oral history program at the Institute for Latino Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Today's, today's date is October 3rd, 2001. We are located in the Julian Samora Library at the campus of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. The interviewer will be myself, Laura Vasquez, and I will be interviewing Daniel Alarcón. He is a fiction writer. He is the author of uh, the novel Lost City, City Radio and the collection of short, short stories, uh, War by Candlelight, and he's also the editor of Etiqueta Negra. <clears throat> Thank you, Daniel, for uh, participating in our oral history program. Sure, happy to. Uh, would you please state your full name, date, and place of birth? Uh, sure. Uh, Daniel Gonzalo Alarcón Solis. I was born in Lima, Peru, in, on March 5th, 1977. Um, once again, thank you for, um, for doing the interview. Sure. Uh, before we dive into questions dealing more closely at your work, um, would you mind stating uh, you know, where you grew up, uh, what sort of family you came from, and whether the arts were encouraged in your household? Or, yeah, or? sure. Um, I was born in in, uh, in Lima, as I mentioned, and um, my family moved to Birmingham, Alabama in 1980 when I was three years old. So I grew up in the Deep South um, in the 80s. Um, my parents were both physicians working at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, and uh, both my parents were big, big readers, you know, they just, uh, my, my, my mom especially reads you know, two or three novels a week now that she's retired, and it's just something that she's, she does. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we, uh, we certainly grew up in a family where not just writing, uh, but also just general storytelling was encouraged. You know, we, we, I remember lots of conversations over the dinner table and stories, and you know, my parents telling us about Peru and about the places they came from, and just hearing those stories. Mm -hmm. So, I know I know in, in previous interviews, um, um, people always ask you about about your parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and you know, as you stated, you you come from a you you came from a, a middle class family mm -hmm. in Peru. You grew up uh, sort of like a middle class upbringing in in, in Alabama. Um, I'm I'm interested in in um, in, in and and how you in your in your in your work on um, in in Lo, in Lost City Radio and in, in your short stories, uh, you write about you know people from from marginalized areas in right. in Peru and 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 in the in the the the, the developing world in general. And I'm I'm curious as to how you you kind of came to um, you know to that place, which is. Not to say that it is not part of your world, but you know it, it's right. Right. No, it's, it's I kind I of distance. From yeah. No, I get what you're saying. Um, I I think uh, there's a lot. I've, I've thought about this a lot. I, I, I think it's it's a fair question. I think um, writers in general have to be willing to push past their comfort zone, push outside their comfort zone. They have to be willing to tell stories um, that they feel. Uh, are, are a challenge, you know. So in my case, you know, th there's a few things. One, we were sort of always aware of and talking about um, the social problems of, of the country we were from, Peru, mm -hmm. in this case. Um, so it was something that was always definitely on our, you know, on our collective mind, you know, as a family. Um, then in particular, you know, my, um, my father's brother was an activist and a union leader in Peru, so he was very directly involved in, in a lot of these social struggles. And when he disappeared in 1989, in the middle of the war, as a family, that marked the turning point. I was 12 years old um, in 89, so that really sort of made a, an impact and was an important event for us and for me particularly. The night that my father was told the news, my sisters and my mom were out they were out of town, so it was just me and my dad, and the phone rang in the middle of the night. I'm talking about like before Skype, before cheap international you, you phone calls. You were 12 calls. years old? 
yeah, I was 12. I remember hearing the phone ringing in the middle of the night and going to the hallway to hear because I heard my father screaming into the phone, like, you know, desperate and very sad and crying. And he didn't tell me what the content of that phone call was for many days, but I remember seeing it, his reaction. And uh, so I guess that uh, that was just something that, that, that was, you know, important for me. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a direct line from that moment to writing Lost City Radio or writing War by Candlelight. A lot of things have to happen in between. But um, I think I, I certainly felt like I was um, uh, pushed to tell those kinds of stories because of what happened to my family. You know, even though it was indirect. You, mm -hmm. know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So. This this is when you were um, 12, and then you you went off to um, well, of course later you went off to school in New York and you you studied anthropology. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your your experience in in college, what that was like? Uh yeah, I I studied anthropology as you, as you said, um, not out of any particular desire to be an anthropologist or anything, but uh, more because it seemed like a an interesting and very open discipline. Um, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I didn't have any doubt about that. So really, it was just a question of fulfilling a major, you know, requirements for a major that would allow me to graduate um, and not take away too much time from creative writing. Um, as it happened, I was able to um, use that um, degree and you know and interpret it in a very open way and they let me sort of have a lot of take a lot of other classes that could only sort of tangentially relate to anthropology but they would give me credit for it so I was able to do a lot of cool stuff you know including you know I did a semester abroad in Ghana um, I taught photography classes up in the Bronx I did all kinds of other stuff that wasn't actually anthropology and per se but it was useful how, how did this um, how did this inform your writing? Um? In a lot of ways, I, I think um, you know anthropology is a particular way of looking at the world and sort of anal looking at culture and analyzing culture. Um, and I think that, that it's true. I have a bit of a of an anthropologist eye, uh, but I like to turn anthropology on on um, cultures I know, you know, or situations I think I know, and sort of try to unpack them. I think it was a useful skill set. Um, um, I liked. I liked being the outsider. I liked sort of stepping out of my comfort zone and being. Being in a place where I probably have no logical reason to be there, you know. And what, what kind of work did you do in, in Ghana? In Ghana, I, I was just a student at the University of Ghana. Oh, okay. Yeah, I took classes in theater, oh. African religion. Um, Took classes in, uh, well, I can't remember. The classes were less important than the actual experience of being in Ghana at the university, which was, you know, I mean, I was 20 years old. You know, it was eye-opening. You know, after um, after college, you went on. Um, you you taught, I believe, in in, in New York. Mm -hmm. On um, you you went as a Fulbright fellow to. Um, you lived in Peru, where you you taught as well. Right. Uh, could could you tell us about that experience of, of um, you know the time between after college and and you know right before you went to 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 Iowa to get your yeah well the first two years I was a public school teacher um, although I really it's two separate jobs in two separate years the first year I worked at a community center in East Harlem where my job was really about uh, truancy and truancy prevention and I did a lot of talking to students about their schooling and sort of visiting them in their apartments and uh, trying to sort of give general counseling. It was a really chaotic community organization, poorly run, like many community organizations are, unfortunately. And uh, even as I described to you, I feel like what's in evidence is how unclear my job description actually was. Because um, I did a lot of different things at a lot of different schools and there was a bunch of different grants that were paying my salary. So each grant had different requirements, and it was a, just a hot mess, basically. Um, the second year, I became a public school teacher in a classroom, and I was teaching in Central Harlem, 
up uh, at 135th Street in St. Nicholas in a school called Bread and Roses Integrated Arts High School. And uh, I taught 10th grade English um, to a really wonderful group of students. It was a public school. It was maybe 60% Dominican, 40% black. A um, bunch of kids from Washington Heights and Dykeman and Inwood areas of Manhattan. Um, and it was just a really interesting school. It was a small school, progressive school. Um, with just great people and great students, um, and uh, I learned a ton. I learned a ton. Um, I think the most important thing I would say from that experience was that prior to being a classroom teacher, I thought of myself as a shy person. Um, and I realized when I was a post school teacher, classroom teacher, every day that I'm actually not that shy. I just had sort of been living with this illusion of myself as shy. But you can't be a shy public school teacher because they'll, they just won't, it just won't work, you know. And uh, so it turns out I'm not shy at all. I just, you know, need an excuse to talk to people. Um, and uh, yeah, man, the, the students really became, you know, good friends, you know, mm -hmm. in some cases. And and then you went to you went, you were, you went to Peru as a. Okay, yeah. Right. So after that, in 2001, I left New York a month before 9-11 uh, on August 11th, uh, 2001. Went to Peru and started classes down there. Um, I believe that's the date, yeah. Uh, maybe August. You, you, were, um, you were living in a, in a um, somewhat um, well-off or maybe a wealthy, I'm not sure how to describe the, the area where you were living, and then you moved to... Um, well, yeah, yeah, I, I can explain that. I was living in a district of Lima called San Isidro, where my parents have an apartment. Um, and San Isidro is, is a very, very nice area of Lima. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, and the apartment's nice, it's, it's very comfortable. Um, but I was doing work in San Juan de Rurigancho, which is kind of on the outskirts of the city. Uh, and it's, you know, that's not, it, it's not, as nice uh, in, in sort of, uh, it's a much, much poorer place. Um, I, I think if you were, if you would look at a Google Earth map of Lima, it's really easy to pick out the places with money, the places without money. And the way you do that is just like, which areas look, which areas from Google Earth are green and which areas are like dust. And um, so San Isidro is generally speaking quite green and San Juan de Rio is you know, broadly speaking, and pretty dusty. And so I was living in San Juan de Lurigancho. I mean, I was working in San Juan de Lurigancho, living in San Isidro, and it was an hour and a half each way. And um, really my first reason for wanting to, to, uh, to live in San Juan de Lurigancho was just to avoid three hours of a day on a bus, which was killing me. And the second reason was... Um, I just knew, I guess intuitively, there would be a richer experience and that I would learn more and, and, uh, and uh, get more out of, out of my time there. And that was the case. You know, I, I moved to San Juan de Rivancho, uh after a few months living in San Isidro and uh, really just had a, an, amazing, an amazing time. How long were you there for? I worked, the, the whole time, the whole project was a year. A year. Yeah, so... Living in San Juan de Rurigancho was probably like uh, eight months of that year, approximately. Um, what kind of, were, you were teaching? And, um, yeah, so what I did was, uh, uh, oddly enough, the same project that I'd done in the Bronx. So my senior year in college, I taught a photography class up in the Bronx at a, in a neighborhood called Cortona Park, which is kind of South Bronx area. And... Um, the, the class there was basically just have the kids take photos, print the photos, have the kids write about the photos. So I just did the same project, except in, in, uh, in San Juan de Rigancho, in this neighborhood called Diez Octubre. And among the kids of Diez Octubre, it was a different age group, because these kids were 14 to 18 years old. Um, we started working and, uh, and produced uh, a book uh, called uh, I think I remember what it's called. I think it's called Imágenes de un Pueblo de Jóvenes, something like that. But it's basically just photos of these, that these kids had taken, plus their, their texts. Um, 
um, yeah, it was quite a it was quite a great uh, project. I mean, it was cool for me to to to, to get to see these images because a lot of times they were from places where I couldn't have gone or, you know, in in situations where I wouldn't have been invited or been able to access. In um, in an interview with uh, Daniel Olivas, um, I believe you, you talk about um, your experience living in that community and how you were able to gain the you know the you were you were immersed in that in that community and, and you know people would come to you with stories and there there's one that's particularly compelling where um I believe it it's a man that you, you, you somehow he learns that you're an anthropologist and he's literally asking you to um to help him dig dig up a mass grave. Um mm -hmm. yeah. Could, could you talk about that? Yeah, it was a it was a really it was, a, it, was a, it was a powerful moment and I felt pretty helpless um, because what happened was, yeah, I was living in this neighborhood and there was a family, uh, uh, the Arones family lived on the corner who was look out for me and sort of take care of me. Uh, not take care of me, but, you know, sort of just look out for me. And uh, their daughter, uh, Pamela, was in my class and Luchito, you know, like wanted to play basketball and I was, by virtue of being American, like, the best basketball player he'd ever seen, and in fact, I'm terrible, but, you know. Uh, in any case, I spent a lot of time with the family, playing with the kids, and, you know, and, and just hanging out. So one day it came out, yes, exactly like you said, that I was an anthropologist. I would studied anthropology, and he, he, uh, he thought that, that was really interesting, and he said, well, wait here, I, I want to show you something. And, and um, he went out and got a, a, a copy of this... Uh, Piece of, this piece of paper that had all these names on it, and all the names uh, and uh, and ages. So it was like you know, uh, you know, Garcia, Angel, uh, you know, comma Antonio, Luis, you know, age eighteen, you know, and uh, on and on and on. All these lists, and it was just men and boys of people who'd been uh, who'd been killed. That's what he explained to me. I was like, oh wow. And so he said he wanted help presenting a case to the Comisión de la Verdad, the Truth Commission. And, uh, I mean, the issue was basically, yes, there was a mass grave in his town, a killing, and these were the people who were missing. And he wanted me, as an anthropologist, to help him dig this place up. Now, of course, I was woefully unqualified to do this. But I remember staring at that list and just feeling helpless, you know? Um, those kinds of things stay with you, and they come out in strange ways. And one of the ways they came out in Lost City Radio, there's a list of names that's very powerful and sort of uh, is an is an central image in, a, a, uh, in the book. And um, it took me a while. I guess I didn't realize this until many years later that that list has has an ancestor, and that it, and that its ancestor is the list that I held in my hand that day. Um, it's just too too. It's too much to think about, you know, if someone gives you a list of names to think about, that each name is a life, you know, and and, uh, and each one of those lives, you know, they had loved ones and they had, you know, family and they had lovers and they had, you know, it's just a lot of weight on just a piece of paper. So uh, it, it, it clearly made an impact and showed up years later in fiction. Did, did you start uh, writing... Um War by Candlelight while you were in, in Peru? No, no, not really. I started writing War by Candlelight before Peru. Didn't write much at all while I was in Peru and then wrote a ton when I left Peru. So that, that was really the trajectory was, you know, in college and then after college, um, I was taking writing classes as often as I could, doing a lot of work on my own and sort of trying to figure out um, how to work on stories, how to write stories. And um, while I was in Lima, I didn't write at all. I just sort of stopped, and it was a big frustration for me because I wanted, I wanted to write, but I didn't know how, you know? I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing with my time. Um, it turns out that while I was a public school teacher, I got more work done than I did when I was in Lima. And, you know, in part because I was super disciplined and uh, 
had so much to do that I had to be very disciplined just to get anything done, you know? Um, and then once I was in, uh, in Lima, once I was in Lima by, you know, and had less free time, I, I spent it all sort of out in the streets talking to people, which ended up being a good investment, but at the time was very frustrating because I wanted to do everything. I wanted to spend 24 hours a day in the streets talking to people, but I also wanted to write, you know, five pages a day. So it didn't happen. But I did go back uh, immediately after Lima. I went to Iowa, mm -hmm. and that's where I started working on my stories and um, really sort of taking the drafts, the, the drafts that were pre-Lima, and revising them and making them stronger and uh, um, and also just starting new material, you know, of the stories from City of Clowns, from War by Candlelight, uh, more than half of them are totally brand new. Um, in fact, do you have the, can I see that? Yeah, I'll tell you. Um, so the, the stories that predate the stories that predate L L Lima, wow, there's very few. Um, yeah, just Lima, Peru, July 28, 1979. Uh, War by Candlelight had written a version of that, of the title story, but it was a, a very odd, uh, kind of very different version that I ended up rewriting completely. But, um, wow, so that made my answer was totally wrong. <laughs> I thought I'd written a lot more of them before Lima. What was the, the experience of uh, being in, in an MFA program? Uh, I mean, just uh, thinking of um, the, the shift from being in, in, in a place like San Juan. Uh, yeah. Like and being, you know, kind of maybe in, I don't want to say isolation because it, I'm sure it was a very uh, intellectually uh, stimulating place, but um, no doubt. But and, and the the contrast, you know, between a, a, an industrialized, pla uh, a first world place to, compared to a, being in a developing country. Well, you know, it was it was really. Uh, I would say San Juan de Rancho felt more industrialized than Iowa in some ways, uh, because where I was living in Iowa was very quiet. And while there wasn't like big industries in San Juan de Rancho, Lima is, you know, city of nine million people almost. And it's just massive, chaotic. And even in San Juan de Rancho, it felt uh, dynamic and loud and full of people and noise and chaos. And uh, so it didn't feel, it didn't feel pre-industrial. It felt, um, I would say almost like, pre, uh, it was just before an economic boom, you know? So it was like, people were building, there was like very poor construction, but there was, you know, right next to houses that were three stories high, you know? There was houses made of lean-tos made of, you know, metal and wood, and like tents right next to stone structures with bricks and, you know, kind of everything in between. So it was, a, it was a very, very energetic place to live, whereas Iowa was more contemplative, you know? It wasn't isolation, I would say. It was very intellectually stimulating, creatively stimulating, and I learned a ton. Um, but it was exactly the right place to be right after Iowa, I gotta say. I mean, right after Lima, right after being San Juan, to be able to go to a place like Iowa where they have, you know... I mean, just the, the libraries alone that we have in this country, I don't think that students here really appreciate what it's like I mean, like a student at one of the best universities in Peru has rarely or never had the opportunity to just walk down among the books, you know, and just walk and see and pull books off the shelves and say, like, I like this one, I like that one. I mean, it's like in, in, in the National Library of Peru, you, you look on the card catalog and you're like, this is the book I want, and you go and you give it to the library, the library brings it to you. But there's less of that serendipity of that ability to walk down browse the shelves and pull one book off the shelf and then pull another one off the shelf. You know what? I want this one. I don't want that one. Or, whoa, look at this weird one right next to it. I mean, I was in heaven. You know, I'd never been in a library that, that immense. You know, uh, I mean, Columbia's library was huge, but to be honest, I gra undergraduates, you know, undergraduates, you know, were mostly 
You don't know why you're in school yet. You don't know what you're trying to learn. You don't haven't yet refined what it is uh, that your intellectual interests are and and embrace them with the rigorous, uh, you know, the rigorous pursuit of those goals. Whereas when you get older, excuse me, and you're in grad school, and you're like, I don't want to waste four years. Like, I, this is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. And, um, and you go out and do it. I mean, at least in my case. And, uh, man, I can't tell you how exciting it was to go into a library again after a year in Peru where I just, you know, didn't, didn't have access to books like that, you know? And, and, and I remember I would go in these little, I would be in San Juan de Lugancho. I'd be always be reading a magazine. And, uh, and uh, the kids in San Juan de Lugancho called uh, magazines revistas. They would call them books, libros. Be like, oh, ¿por qué siempre tienes un libro? And I'd be like, esto no es un libro, esto es una revista. And they never, never really heard the word revista. Like, they didn't differentiate between books and magazines. Um, just because there were so few, there was, there was very little reading material in general around, you know? And I'm talking about kids who were illiterate, and I want to be very clear that all these kids could read, but there just wasn't a lot of material for reading, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, so personally, as a, as a lifelong, voracious reader, um, to come back from Lima and go into Iowa, and, you know, I spent m half of my waking hours or more in that library. To, um, to go back a little bit to, um, well, to go into your work, actually, mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of, of some of the stories like, um, like the bridge, and also the moment when you get that that list, yeah, um, when you were living in Peru, and uh, you know how this this led to, to actual, um, you know, uh, stories, and, yeah, and, and stuff. Um, wh what is your, um, I guess, what is your your writing process? How do you like, how do you come up with, 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 with well, your ideas, with your material? Well, you know, the, the two examples you mentioned, I think, it's, a, it's a, the, the, the second one, the one of the list, is a more inscrutable act because it took me years to realize that that list was part, was, came from the previous list, you know? With the bridge, the, it's a little bit more straightforward because I heard there's a, the, an anecdote from, uh, and uh, then it turned out a friend of mine had covered this story when he worked for a paper that a truck knocked over a pedestrian bridge and the pedestrian bridge collapsed and then a blind couple the next day uh, walked across the bridge uh, and fell. Uh, in fact, it was in the real story, it was just a blind man um, because they had neglected to cover the ends of the, the stairs on either side of the avenue. Um, so that was a story I heard. Uh, in the real story, I think the blind man did not die. Um, in my story, the couple has run over or you know, I can't remember how they they fall and they die. Um, and the reason I, I I liked it, you know, there's there's sometimes when anecdotes, little episodes, sort of contain within them a great deal of truth, you know, and uh, and they get at something that's hard to explain. In this case, it's hard to explain, you know, how the the dark humor of living in a place like Lima. It's hard to to find those episodes that encapsulate all of the travails of living in an underdeveloped or oddly developed place where on the one hand, you know, you can have, um, you know, glitzy shopping malls and skyscrapers and on, and on the other you have neighborhoods where, you know, uh, you know, something like so absurd can happen, you know, and uh, where uh, a pedestrian bridge collapses and no one thinks to cover the entrances and, you know, tragedy ensues. So, um, yeah, I just played around with it. I kept it sort of in the back of my head and then eventually found a way to create a story around it. It, was, it wasn't more than that. Um, I mean, it was more than that, of course. It took a long time and it took a lot of thinking. And, um, but I think generally it's hard to talk about one's process because so much of what happens is completely mysterious. Mm -hmm. um, Lost City Radio, of course, is, um, is set in an un unnamed um, country. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a country in Latin America, but it's not named. Um, um, somewhere you say that, um, you know, if, if Peru or if Lima were, were an imagined city, like someone in, in say, in, in Mexico City or uh, in Ghana or, you know, in, in another part of the developing world, um, would be able to, to, to recognize yeah. um, this, this, this place. 
I guess what I'm trying to say is is what I find find so compelling about your work is that it it it's very much grounded in, in the history of Peru and and in that place, but it, it's it, it's it's like a mirror uh, for for the, these these phenomena that are going on in the world that are, are that make it hard to to distinguish for example where 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 North America ends where Latin America begins mm -hmm. um you know where where there there's you know like you said you know malls on one side of the town and you know um like slums on the other end mm -hmm. um could could you talk a, a little bit about that? yeah yeah well i think there's a couple things there one is the the the, the 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 basic drama of the developing world is uh, in the developing city. I think in particular, is you have these 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 two kind of trends hurtle, hurtling at each other with great speed. And one is sort of uh, hyper capitalist, you know, development, quote unquote. And the other is is kind of uh, fast um, migration. You know, so you have all you know these, you know. The rip, rapid capitalization of of, a, of an economy, and you have like masses of people moving into this place. So it creates this, this cauldron, it's this heat, you know, and it's intense. And um, each city in each developing country is different, you know. But a lot of countries have these cities that are these theaters for the the uh, the absurd in lots of cases, um, theaters of 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 great political, social, economic change. Um, so that's why I write about those places, and that's why I think that if I write about Lima, I'm also writing about Karachi, and I'm also writing about Mexico City, and also writing about, you know, Lagos, you know, even though I've never been to Lagos or Karachi, you know, I have been to Mexico City, but, um, and I can tell you that it's just like Lima, just bigger, you know, um, and of course, I think, of course, Karachi is probably very different from Lima, but, uh, but I think it would be surprising how similar it might be. Um, so that's one thing. The other, the other thing that you said that I found really interesting was that, you know, it's harder these days to tell where North America ends and South America ends. And I, I think that's something that I generally think of as a good thing. And I, I, I think of um, the U.S. as, as a Latin American country. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I remember tell, a, a Chilean friend told me once that uh, he thought of the Smiths as a Chilean band because uh, when he was growing up he danced to it while he was in Chile and he was so he was like well you know we didn't really consider that it might be in they might be singing in English that was completely irrelevant what mattered was that we were in Chile and we were dancing so ergo the band must be Chilean it doesn't matter if they were you know from Liverpool or wherever the hell it's missing from you know what I mean mm -hmm. um, and I just find that interesting I think that that uh, culture is very malleable language is very malleable and borders uh, are very poor uh, at keeping people apart, you know, as much as politicians currently, I think, would like to believe otherwise, um, you know, the people have been, you know, wailing and crying about the border for years, but the Browning of America happened already. Like, I don't know what people are tripping about. It's already happened, so they need to just get over it. Um, and there's nothing that they can do at the border now or even 20 years ago that would have stopped it this is just reality so people need to just deal with it um and um the u.s is a latin american country you know that's great let's deal with that but let's stop pretending it's not and let's stop you know bemoaning uh the, this this you know demographic fact you know mm -hmm. um and I, I generally find all of these to be positive developments i think it's good for the united states to do a little soul searching and think about what it is, what it, kind of country it actually is. I think that's a good thing. Um, and I think in terms of my work, you know, I feel like I can write about the U.S. without writing directly about the U.S. You know, I think Lost City Radio is a George Bush novel, you know, uh, written clearly in response to a lot of the stuff that was happening in the war of terror. And, uh, and it makes me, you know, it makes me comfortable saying I'm an American writer at the same time as I might be a Peruvian writer or a Latino writer or whatever other kind of writer you want me to be. Um, but I don't think it has to be one or the other, you know. Um, so I can continue to write about quote-unquote developing world or Latin America, but 
just understand that I'm writing about Latin America, and I assume the United States is also a Latin American country. And so, therefore, when I write about Latin America, I'm also writing about the U.S. Mm. How, do, um, how do you view yourself? I mean, um, you're, you're a writer, but um, you're also almost like, like, you know, like a bridge between, between um, North America and South America, but... Um, I mean, I guess like you don't, you don't, you don't limit your scope of of writing. Even though you're writing about the developing world, it, it's um. I don't, I don't know how to frame my question. Um. Like you're doing more than, than, than what what a writer is, I guess, is supposed to do. I mean, you're you're in in a sense, almost building, like dialogues and truths. About, well, about. well, yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. I mean, that's, that's, that's flattering to think that. I think um, it's important, it, given my my um, my place, you know, as a as a writer working in English, working in this you know literary world, who uh, is connected very closely with Latin America, you know, and reading in Spanish and working in Spanish as well. You know, I, I do have a unique position. Um, I worked a lot with a magazine in Peru called Etiqueta Negra, and uh, and I tell this a lot, but it's 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 worth repeating that I feel like a lot of times in the U.S. I'm called upon to interpret Latin America for Americans, and in Peru I've also I was often called upon to interpret the U.S. for Peruvians, and you know it was much harder to interpret the U.S. for Peruvians. And I'll just give one example for our food issue one year, I wrote a piece about competitive eating. Um, which I don't know if you know, but it's just like when people sort of try to eat a lot of hot dogs in like two minutes or it's this thing that's big in the United States. So I was trying to explain this to Peruvians, you know, in a Peruvian magazine and, uh, and it just didn't, didn't make any sense. My editor kept telling me, you know, this, we, we want you to write a piece of nonfiction. And I was like, no, seriously, this really happens, you know, and I had to send him YouTube links and photos before he would believe me because he was like, you serious? You know, so... Uh, it's it's funny that the roles that you get asked to play um, as an interpreter, as a bridge, you know, all those things are, are I accept, you know. Um, I just want to make sure that, you know, it's clear that a bridge goes both directions. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm also explaining the U.S. as an exotic place to Peruvians. I, I, I think it's interesting, though, what you meant, the, the, the flow going both ways, which um, I know you get asked a lot. Whether it's legitimate to um, to write about Latin America in English, but but um, the fact the fact that you write in English, it, it sort of reflects that that um, you know that that I guess that mestizaje, mm -hmm. that bridge that is that is that is going both ways. So so to me, it, it never bothered me that not to say that it's bothersome that you write in English about Latin America, but I, I instantly saw that as, as a you know, as part of this 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 global phenomenon that, that we've been yeah, talking about. I, I mean, you know, there's 50 million uh, Latinos in the U.S., 55 million, something ridiculous. Um, you know, that makes the U.S. a, a larger Spanish-speaking country than Spain, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, it's inevitable that literary cultural production from Latinos is going to is going to happen in Spanish in the U.S. or in English in the U.S. and and it's just you know it's just going to happen. So um, I I I do think it's 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 an, a natural and unavoidable uh, process. And of course, there's going to be people who choose to write in English and other people who choose to write in Spanish, and both both are legitimate. And you have a book in Spanish called um, El Rey Está Siempre Por Encima del Pueblo. Mm -hmm. um, could you, could you talk about this book? I don't think it, it's available in English. It's not available in English, but not 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 you know for any huge mysterious reason, but mostly because uh, the book was written in English and translated. So it's not like uh, stories that I wrote in Spanish. Okay. It's stories that I wrote in English, including the bridge, like the, the you mentioned, uh, and others. Um, but for contractual reasons, you know, in the U.S., publishing industry is would prefer a novel, and so while I finished my novel. Uh, the stories should, won't come out. Basically, is the situation. So um, 
the collection, I think, is, you know, putting together a collection is an interesting thing because you go back and you re review all the things that you've written since your last collection came out. And then you figure out which ones of those are related, which ones of those sort of can fit together well, which ones of those uh, belong, you know, in another book. And uh, it's kind of like putting together a mixtape or a playlist or something. That's a fun process. I enjoyed it. And you're, you're also working on a, a graphic novel? The graphic novel's out. The graphic so. novel was published last year in Peru. It's called Ciudad de Payasos. And it's based on a, collect, on a, on a story of mine. Um, called City of Clowns, which is in War by Camp. Which is in War by Camp. Exactly. What what drew you to um, to that um, medium? Uh, a couple things. One, I wanted to work with Sheila uh, Alvarado, who's the illustrator. Um, I wanted to um, uh, sort of look. There look, there'd never been a graphic novel published in Peru before. Our graphic novel, so I really wanted it to come out, and I really wanted it to be the best possible. Uh, graphic novel. Uh, we we set our very high standards and worked on it for a year and a half, and I think I think it came out really well. I mean, I'm really proud of it. Um, I'd been reading a lot of Joe Sacco, who's a great a great graphic journalist working here in the states, and uh, I just wanted to, to to collaborate with Sheila and put something together. Um, you have a a piece called. Um Life Among the Pirates. Yeah. And um, in there you, you talk about um, you know, the, the piracy industry in Peru regarding um, books. And um, you, um, you, talk about, um, you talk about how there, there's a perceived idea that you know, the, these book pirates are kind of making, making uh, literature available for, for you know, the masses. Right. Um, in Peru, but in reality, um, it, it's still middle class people for the most part that are purchasing the, these books. Um, right. So there's kind of, a, of a, an irony, I guess. Yeah, the tension within that industry is great. I mean, it's uh, because on the one hand, the myth, the idea that uh, book piracy exists for the masses is very seductive and it's a wonderful notion. And I'm sure in part it is true. However, um, if you just notice where it is that the book pirates, the booksellers, the uh, unlicensed booksellers are hanging out, mostly they're in middle class and upper middle class neighborhoods or, or along the beach or you know, places where people with money congregate. Um, so it isn't necessarily the case that they're taking books to the masses. I think, generally speaking, um, uh, intellectual rights is such a is such a poorly understood concept. Intellectual property is such a poorly understood concept that no one, rich or poor or middle class, um, thinks that book piracy is an issue or a crime or anything to be worried about. Period. So, um, you know, they go where the money is, and the money is with rich people always. And um, your your book. Um, your novel has been pirated. Yeah, of, of, of my books, all, uh, except for Ciudad Payas, the graphic novel, all three of them have been pirated. Mm -hmm. what, what was that? How did that make you feel when you... Well, I, I mean, at first, you know, the first time, I, and I said to talk about this in the piece, the first time I ever saw my book pirated was uh, when I went to go uh, do a reading in one of the prisons, and I showed up, and I had a gift of my, the book for the library. And uh, and they keep, this player was like, oh, we already got it, and they showed it to me, and it was clearly a pirated copy, with um, you know this weird lettering on the front, and it was just clearly not my book, you know. And then they felt bad, and they pretended to be that they hadn't known it was pirated, and they kept apologizing. And I was like, you know, it's fine, you know, it's totally fine. I don't, I don't, I don't care. But you know, maybe I would care more if my livelihood were based on book sales in Peru, but. Realistically, that's just not the case. You know, people don't make a living off book sales in Peru. It's not possible. Going back to um, Law City Radio, um, uh, one of the, the the most subtle things that your novel do does is that uh, it reveals the the human teachings that um, the grand or the official historical narratives often mask. Um, it's um, 
you know, um, my, my question is, how, how can a work of fiction like Lost City Radio reveal more about the, the futile logic of violence, about the complex relationships, the motives and drives that make it incredibly hard to distinguish between those, those that oppress and those who are the oppressors? Well, that's a tough question. I think um, generally the, you know, violence is its own language. Um, and I, I don't think there's any novel that can adequately describe, uh, you know, how intractable and how inscrutable that language can be. I don't think it's possible for an act of violence to, to really have a message um, except terror, you know, but that's just my personal sort of, that's my personal sort of feeling. Um, it, it's hard to, to justify violence in any in any case in any in any circumstance. Um, what I wanted to do with the novel was simply try to explain that, uh, or to show that, to demonstrate um, that for whatever grievance whatever grievances might have sparked a conflict, whatever complaints justified or not that might have sort of been the in, been the starting point of of a an insurrection in this particular country that I described, um, five years out, seven years out, nine years out, there's been so much bloodshed and so much chaos that has come of it that no one remembers exactly how the war started. So one of the things that happens in Los Angeles is people, they, they keep, you know, they ask Ray at a certain point, you know, you're, you're educated, you're from the city, tell us how did this start? And he doesn't remember either. No one can remember exactly what, uh, what set things off, and I think that's, you know, the, the the kind of tragedy of it all. It's not. It's this text that no one can read, you know. Um, all they know is now there's you know seventy thousand dead. So hey, how do we get here again? You know, that's what I really wanted to get at. Was the the the, you know, you start the dance and then you know you don't you don't know when to stop. You know? mm. um. Like to ask you to, um, you know, mo most people um, know know your work through through these two books, um, War by Candlelight and Lost City Radio. But you were also working on a program called uh, Radio Ambulante. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what it is. And yeah, of course. Uh, Radio Ambulante is, um, you know, in the U.S. there's these these great shows like This American Life or Radio Lab or Snap Judgments or. American Radio Works, you know, these, uh, these programs that take uh, the, the aesthetics of, of, you know, really good sort of journalism, but transfer it to audio. Um, and we're really interested in that, that kind of storytelling aesthetic. Um, and so uh, what we've been doing, and I say we because it's a team, there's four of us, five of us, um, we've uh, sort of pushed out into the world with this, this idea. You know, we want to do this American life in Spanish and transnational and uh, talk to people all over Latin America. And, Will uh, it be like a um, like podcast? Or? Yeah, the idea is for it to be a podcast. The idea is for it to be um, downloadable, streamable. Um, but we also want to be on the air in radio stations in Latin America. So we want to be on RPP in Peru, on Radio Caracol in Colombia, on Radio Unam in Mexico, you know. As many places we can get on. Those are just ideas. Not that we have no, no contracts signed or anything. But uh, but I don't think it's unreasonable to to believe we could get on radio stations uh, fairly soon. Um, but so we've just been pushing pushing the idea out, and you know, among my network of journalists and uh, you know, journalism schools all over, all over South America and Central America and Mexico and um, and uh, and here in the states, you know. It's been a really interesting process. We just did our first call for pitches and got back like 50 plus um, ideas for stories, you know, from journalists and writers and radio producers um, from more than a dozen countries. So it's, it's, it's been pretty exciting. Right now we're doing the pilots. We hope to launch in March of next year. How did, how did this idea come about? I started to, well, in 2007, late 2007, early 2008, I was uh, hired by the BBC to do a radio program, a radio documentary in Peru. Um, and they sent a producer from London 
who met me in Lima and we did a whole project together and it was a really fantastic experience. However, um, I sort of had the feeling that a lot of the best ideas and a lot of the best subjects uh, uh, were uh, left out of the final edit um, because they didn't speak English and because we couldn't do many voiceovers, you know? So it doesn't sound good to do 45 minutes of voiceovers, you know, it just doesn't, good, doesn't make for good radio. So um, my, my thought then was that what if we had a program that could, that could do uh, Latin American stories in Spanish? It's pretty simple, really. It's not, it's not groundbreaking. I'm not the first person to have this idea, but um, kind of bizarrely, it doesn't exist yet. You know, this kind of storytelling is not, it's not happening anywhere uh, that we've been able to find. Um, so the idea came from that, that BBC experience, uh, which was a great experience and a real learning process, a real wonderful opportunity. But um, I just had the thought, wow, you know, this person would be great if only we could get them to speak in their, in their own voice, you know? Mm. And uh, I'd, I'd like you to read um, a, a piece you did uh, when you were blogging for, um, for the New Republic. Okay. It has to do with... Um, the World Cup? Sure. Um, then I'd like to ask you some questions about it. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. I lived in Ghana back in 1998, so their match against Uruguay was a real threat to my usual pan-Latin American approach to World Cup soccer fandom. I respect their game. I adore the country. I felt uncomfortable rooting against them, and I would have supported Ghana against any team besides the U.S. or Latin American side. Like everyone else, I was hoping to see an African side go through, and who knows what this marvelous, hard-working team might have accomplished with a healthy Michael Essien in the midfield. Still, the unlikely prospect of four South American semifinalists had awakened some quixotic Bolivarian dream deep in my chest, and even after Brazil's loss, I found myself, almost against my will, supporting Uruguay. Football, as I wrote earlier, is cruel, but this was on another order of magnitude, one of the cruelest matches I've ever seen. I offered a friend of mine, a Ghana supporter, one of these platitudes, but she wasn't having it. She wasn't having it. Soccer, she said, is a little too much like life for my tastes. We have Luis Suarez and his handball to thank for the dramatic finish to what was an already very dramatic and entertaining match. I've read some criticism of Suarez, but anyone who's ever played the game or who understands the stakes knows he had no choice. This is not cheating. It's what a coach of mine once called a professional foul. Suarez committed an infraction and the ref immediately and appropriately sent him off. FIFA is looking into suspending him more than one game, which would be a shame considering Suarez has been one of the tournament's more lethal goal scorers. But certainly they have the right to sanction players who commit deliberate handballs at the goal line. That was the risk he took. In Uruguay, some newspapers are already comparing Suarez's defensive handball to Maradona's infamous Hand of God goal. The comparison is apt. The Uruguayan striker made a split-second defensive decision and it proved to be the correct one. If Adiyai's header goes in, you go home. If you stop it with your hands, you're still alive. He knew what he'd done, knew that it was a gamble that most likely wouldn't pay off, but then that's the nature of a gamble, isn't it? And it was impossible not to be moved by his emotional reaction to the red card and the resulting missed penalty kick. The wild shift from despair to joy seen on this video, this is part of what makes the tournament so amazing. Why this year and every four years until I die, I will somehow spend a month watching the World Cup and little else. I made this promise to myself when I was a child, and I intend on keeping it. Every four years, my faith in drama is renewed. One man, I think, deserves a word of praise. Asamoa Gyan is my hero. I suppose there can be little consolation for him now, or that he's buried in a deep post-game depression. The images of his teammates trying to lift him off the pitch at the end of the match were heartbreaking, but missed penalty kicks happen. And remember, his team still had a chance to win. Whether they deserved it or not is a question I'm not prepared to answer. There are no moral victories in football. You either execute or you don't. Ask Brazil. As Diego, who sadly will not be stripping naked and running through the streets of Buenos Aires. After that miss, a lesser man would have crumbled, but it was Gian who took that long walk to the penalty spot and with the full weight of his mistake on his shoulders and calmly, okay, perhaps not calmly, knocked Ghana in Ghana's first penalty kick of the shootout. He carried his team far into the tournament and has every reason to be proud. The composure, the character required to take the first penalty of the shootout and convert it, after having missed the potential game winner just moments before, it's almost inconceivable. 
there's a tragic luster to the achievement, but it is without question one of the most beautiful and admirable moments of the tournament for me. I was um, was watching that that game uh, this last summer too. Yeah, I have to say it was probably one of the most uh, thrilling yeah games ever, and um, one of one of the first um, I guess academic books or whatever that I read, you know, growing up. Um, was a book called uh, Football La Soli Sombra by Galeano. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you're, I think you and Galeano are the only writers that I know that write about the about. World Cup. And well, there's a lot more. There's a lot more. I'll, I mean, I'll share a reading list with yeah. you. I, I love writing about soccer, man. I yeah. mean, I think um, I uh, it's a sp it's a sport that I that I'm passionate about. It's a sport that I play still. It's a sport a sport that uh, like no other in terms of how beautiful it can be to watch, you know. Um, and the World Cup is, uh, as much as FIFA is a corrupt mafia of, you know, disgusting, lecherous human beings, um, in spite of that, the game persists, you know, the game and people's passion for the game is, is still sort of un untainted by, by that by the, the crassness of FIFA's, uh, you know, mafia bosses. Um, it's such a such a, a beautiful thing. It's particularly beautiful to play football here in the United States, I think, because it's so international. You know, you can p play in any city, in any town, and you're going to be playing with, you know, Mexicans and Polish and, you know, um, Peruvians and French and Italians and, you know, Armenians and Ethiopians, you know. And it's fun. I mean, it's just a, a way to see the world without leaving your neighborhood, you know. Any town, if you want to find the most international group of people, just go to the soccer pitch. Yeah. So, I think it's, it's one of those um, beautiful consequences of, of the world in which we live and in which you, you write about. Um, yeah. It's one of the, it's a gem, one of the very... No, it's compelling, I think. Okay. Yeah. Is there, is there anything else you would like to add? No, no, I just want to thank you for, for the interview. Thank it's you. Been, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Cool, man. It was my pleasure. Thank you.